Hello, Gwillem and Joe. Hello. Uh, lovely to meet you. I've read in your notes that uh, you're aware that there are sort of Queen fanatics watching the film quite uh, analytically. Mm -hmm. So just to warn you, I'm that guy. Yeah, okay, all right, no You're the pressure. one writing me all those messages on Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> no, not on Instagram, on skin. Oh, okay. Uh, the for me. <laughs> I just wanted to start by asking, before you even heard about the project or the casting or anything like that, what what was Queen to you in your life? And don't feel you have to say you were big sort of super fans if you weren't. Funny enough, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody is the first song I ever downloaded on Napster. Remember what Napster? a modern You've got fable. To, You've got yes, to stop right. saying that. It's <laughs> highly legal and, and really Certainly, awful. Certainly, yeah. You shouldn't be saying I, I'm, I'm deeply shamed yeah. uh, that I didn't pay for that song, but now I've bought everything they've ever made. Yeah. <laughs> and Dara, I'm in a movie about them, okay? Yeah. Well, you've got, the, uh, you've got the orange Hungarian vinyl of Hammer to Fall. Oh, uh, naturally. Oh, here we go, here we go. <laughs> or t tell Eject. me, tell me. We need sign to copy. You, <laughs> I, you don't have the no, blue don't. Bohemian Rhapsody vinyl, do you? No. No, of course, of course. Sounds like you do. Oh, I will. Bring it. Yeah. Um, bring it? There's only 200 copies available. Oh. <laughs> but no, listen, you know what's funny? When I was a kid, it was sort of like, you know, it was very much like the Nirvana, Pearl Jam sort of era. Yeah. And so it was that kind of brooding music where it was like, mm. you don't get it, Dad, you know? And, <laughs> and like Queen with its like, it was like it's it's like sort of like celebration music I feel mm. like you know and so it wasn't until I think I got to college that I really started appreciating how intricate the songs were and and how influential they were and how they crossed genres and Correct. generations Correct. Uh, <laughs> and, but it really did take that right where you sort of had to listen to it with a different ear and start being like actually these guys are brilliant and all of mm. these songs are beautiful and lyrically they're amazing and Freddie Mercury's voice is out of control and the take, harmony take, take. is like are incredible but and so I think that and, and um, for me also I, I ended up uh, directing a film and literally every day going to set I would pump myself up by listening to somebody to love on the Lovely. way to work. And so my fandom just kept going up, up, up until this film. And it's now ridiculous. Mm. Not quite your level, I don't think, Thank but I, I'm on my way. <laughs> we'll talk in two years. Yes. And it's just going to be... The difficult thing about this film is like you, you always want to know everything you can about this about your character when you're doing a, when you're doing a film or anything. Uh, and you want to be the expert on that character. But as much research as you can do, we'll always find people that will know way <laughs> more than us because... I yeah. have to say, watching the film, there's a, there's a quite special feeling as a super fan of something when you realise that someone else cares as much as you do about something really small mm. and um, I, I, the, the voice like when I first saw the trailer yeah that uh, freaked me out how <laughs> how it wasn't close to it was was Brian's voice right and then I have to admit thinking he'll probably gloss over Deacon because he always gets glossed over uh. but the smile you do that's sort of slightly flat yeah. and goes down at the back uh. I was I was sat, probably the, maybe the only person in that screen going he's noticed John Deacon's <laughs> smile yeah. someone else knows about John Deacon's and the little that yeah. movement I mean what where did you start with each character because I guess a Brian's voice isn't like a super doable voice mm. and also there's not a great deal of Deacon footage available so w what was the in, in for each of you to the to the character well the internet's a great thing it was an amazing resource and we've watched every interview you can possibly imagine they've ever ever given I think in the 1985 86 concerts in Wembley they had cameras trained on each each of them individually yeah uh, throughout the whole have you seen the raw the raw footage. But what, the, the whole concert? Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly that. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you have like Deaky, you have Deaky Cam, you have Brian Cam, you have wow. uh, Roger Cam, all this kind of thing. So you just you see them when they're not when they don't even think they're being seen. Mm. Those are the things that I really wanted to try and find with the the, the moments that they're not putting on a, a public face. And there's some brilliant interviews where um, the camera keeps rolling after an interview and Brian gets a little bit angry with an interviewer and starts shouting at someone making noise off stage, which was great because you see something of his, like, you know, an angry side, which you don't see because he's such a gentle person mm. when he presents himself publicly. But also there's a great little um, audio thing of uh, some outtakes of them in a recording studio when they're having a row the four of them are arguing with each other and that was so insightful because you find out about their chemistry and who was the one to placate who was the one that was winding everyone up who was the one that was fed up and just had had enough I um, was told that they were interested in me in this role and they were like you know apparently you look a lot like John Deacon the bassist 
And so I was like, do I? I, so I? So I just Googled him quickly. And I then called my mother and said, Mom, what were you doing in 1983? Because I think <laughs> I found my long lost father. But I remember just looking and saying, you know, if I squint my eyes a little bit and sort of bring my lip out, my top lip, yeah, I sort of look like, I do look like him. And then came the voice which uh, they wanted to hear my accent. And so I studied that every day on set. I would like just listen to like a 10 minute interview with him. And, and again, yeah, it, it is harder to find things with, with Deaky, but you can find them, you know, you, you just, you can go down that rabbit hole and find these interviews with him. And so I would try to listen to interviews where just he spoke so that mm. I wasn't influenced by the other voices. Um, and then it was the movements. It was that Deaky cam, the 1986 concert. And, and Polly Bennett gave us just like that she was our movement coach and she just gave us like a, a treasure trove of things that we didn't think we could ever find and and it is amazing because like some of the things I did in the movie or like some people have seen them on commercials or whatever and I've gotten com I got a comment where it was like I've never seen Deaky move like that and then 10 people rushing in to go Montreal 1981 <laughs> like they knew exactly where yeah, yeah, I had yeah. gotten the move from yeah. and I was like they're right because I copied that because I wanted to do what he did in Bohemian Rhapsody and get it in the movie and it, it's amazing to see the super fans knowing like that level of detail and appreciating it and coming to my defense when, <laughs> when they see something that maybe they felt like they hadn't seen before. Right. And you'll appreciate this, uh, you know, because Brian May was on set for a lot of the concert stuff and, and, and you would think that maybe he would just focus on Gwill and want to make sure that that was perfect, but he was so generous with his time and, and wanting to make sure that we were all like, you know, the best that we could be. And so he would even give me tips. Like he would say, you know, Joe, Deaky used to lick his fingers during songs because the strings would get stuck mm. so he'd literally be off to the side in between takes going Joe Joe <laughs> like, okay right yeah I gotta do that yeah. and so I would make sure that like I would get those little details in and uh, Brian was uh, awesome for, for especially for you know not just the emotional support and just like cheering us on and feeling like he had our blessing but just these little details I have this great picture that I took on day one when he first saw the wig and it's Brian that's May. That's what he calls me now. I'm just the wig. <laughs> the wig. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what I call The blonde and the wig. Uh, that's, I, there's a picture of him just fixing Brian May, fixing Brian May's hair <laughs> to make sure that every strand is perfect. Yeah. It's really nice. It's a real moment. It's always dangerous when sort of someone has charge of their own legacy in, in, in sort of film and, and music and stuff. So, but I'm, I'm, it sounds like having Brian and Roger there was very useful. But I wonder if there was any ever a time where they were sort of asking you to dial back maybe slightly more rock and roll elements or slightly negative elements of their characters because obviously everyone is, you know, there's different facets to, to every character in, and especially in a rock band. He and Roger were very present and very helpful and supportive, of, as we've said, during all the musical sequences. And they were, they're musical producers on the, on the film. But when it came to the more dramatic scenes, the, the kind of intimate, private moments, they left us to it. They, they really wanted us to explore those scenes properly and to be able to tell that story faithfully and, and mm -hmm. truthfully, I think. So they tried to leave us space to do that properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they, I mean, they certainly, they, I think they gave notes to the producers or whatever, you know, because they are executive producers on the film. With us, they were just always like completely supportive. And, mm -hmm. and I know they love the film. When, when, after they saw the film, Brian wrote us each individual emails, just like praising our performances. And that was like, I think the best moment for me, like no matter what happens with this movie or like, any of it just to have Brian May be like job well done was the biggest relief and like the most rewarding thing that I think we it's also have. great to know he's on email yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, do you do you, yeah. do you have the Brian May won <laughs> at one. Uh, one, Yahoo he wasn't the first uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, th I'm assuming there was no contact with John during the, the filming John lives a very private life um, and which is his right and um, he's look he supports the film but from, from a distance mm -hmm. and he says you know sort of go get him and, uh, you know, good luck. Um, but I think that's John's right, you know, to, to just sort of, uh, I think when Freddie passed, passed away, he was deeply affected by that. I don't want to speak for him too much, but it was just, he wanted to back away and, and just sort of go back to a much more simple um, light, life. Mm -hmm. I don't think that the limelight was ever something that he particularly enjoyed. And um, and I think that he's, I, I hope anyway, that he's he's happy. And one day I really do hope to meet him and maybe just have a cup of tea with him, maybe when yeah. this all dies down. But we'll see. I got to meet one of his sons though, which was really, really wonderful, yeah. And I felt like I learned a lot 
from sitting down with him because it's more sort of the 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 age that John was that that I'm playing John and I just felt his humor and his intellect mm. and sort of uh, you know the way he sees life it was it was quite something and we looked quite alike too it was mm. sort of fun. <laughs> um, a quick question if you could both of you travel back in time and go to one Queen gig which would it be Live Aid. Live it has to be, I think. Interesting. Yeah, personally. You can't also have live aid. I know. I think then it would have to be, like, Wembley 86 then. Yeah. Okay. That's when, that's interesting. The bat, Brian and Roger always said, 1986, that was them at their absolute yeah. peak. Yes. They said that was in their zenith. They, they felt their full power at that moment. Radio X.